This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Selenite R. Evolution by Cecilia Udave Translated by Toshia Kame In a clearing in the forest, she fixed her gaze on the pale moon shining against the dark night sky. Tiptoeing on a small mound covered with sticky, moss-like grass, she made out the tiny craters in the barren lunar soil. Without binoculars, without a telescope, she spotted the erosion on the luminous, lifeless sphere. A shudder shot through her. Rather, this internal jolt forced her to put aside her melancholy thoughts. Yet, as she tried to feel something, a presentiment of catastrophe filled her. While she hesitated, a gentle breeze tickled her face. It felt fresh, almost icy. When she brought her hands over her face, her cheeks crystallized a little, although her internal heat immediately thawed the thin layer of frost on her face and the rest of her body. She felt no cold, felt almost nothing. It was about time. Act now or lose herself forever in the internal revolution sweeping everything. Her pride crumbled. Her sex was merely a decorative, pale readout of pleasant echoes. At most, it expelled odorless gray urine, viscous or watery, depending on who knows what the nanobots were doing to her. Her cravings had gradually dwindled and eventually petered out. Sensations? About to fade away, devastated by the invasion. The nanobots are equipped only with mechanical phagocytes. They will help you fight disease. They will be your new natural defense. Don't worry, we control them, they assured her. If no one can control nature, not even a new kind of nature. The engineer came excited, anxious, alive. She felt disgust as certain feelings still moved in her brain. Not the noblest certainty, although her old consciousness was slowly relegated to the mental walls of logic and preservation. Something was left of her. Something. Where have you been? I've been looking for you for hours. Can't you hide in a less cold place? If it weren't for the fact that I can track down the tenants, I'd never find you. She always thought it silly to call them that. Perhaps the first ones fit the bill, because they went in and out after they operated some internal changes and deposited artificial cells that would verify the connections and establish contact with her DNA, building communication bridges between her body's native cells and the foreign ones that would come to stay. She christened them with another name, Selenites. Perhaps because she loved gazing at the moon since she was a child. Perhaps because she considered herself a lunar inhabitant. I've been all over the place, she answered, without going into details. I go anywhere, can't I? Quit it. We've got to talk. You can't wander about. Not now. We're so close. You shouldn't disappear like that. She had plenty of reasons to kill him right there. No, he never listened to her. He was only interested in knowing what went on inside her body, not how she felt, while the Selenites roamed, stripped, expelled her. He stuck to the data. Blinded by the positive results, he paid no attention to the reasons that brought her and the others to the medical nanobiotechnology program in hopes of lessening pain. Participants didn't come here to become better, or to aspire for an absurd cellular eternity. And so they were filled with fourth-generation microvivores, cell cocktails under specific design. 
He and his fellow vital engineers sat waiting for chance to throw the necessary conditions at them. The perfect combination for biomolecular dice to eject a new kind of nature. She jumped down from the mound and stood in front of him. Amazing, he said. You've seen nothing yet. Well, I want to see everything, he said and opened his briefcase. I've got to give you an injection first. Not only did you break the safety protocol, but you ignored your dosing schedule. She extended her arm, which now seemed increasingly laden, just as her veins. As the engineer prepared the syringe, she gazed at his rough skin, his reddish-bluish capillaries, and his sweat from embarking on his journey on foot. She took a deep breath, as if to sniff at his aged body, which was kept strong by the excitement of discoveries. For an hour, her senses had heightened. She could hear, smell, observe, feel, taste his entire body, each organ, each pump of his heart driving blood through his veins. But far from being pleasurable or exciting, she found him ineffective, an overload of sensations, now useless. They deprived him of other activities which she believed were more essential at this stage of the body readjustment process. The engineer couldn't stick the needle into her hardened gray skin. Hmm, you've suffered from capillary fragility, he said, looking for a softer spot for the needle. Hooking you up to an IV was torture. I left you with purple bruises. Now I can't even stick this needle into your skin. See it? You're healed, stronger, even younger. In our last study, we verified that your body not only healed, but also it's near perfect. I knew it. It wasn't simple intuition. Cells think and act accordingly. They aren't merely oriented towards conservation and multiplication. We can copy their thought systems, their logic, standardize it, and subject it to our needs. In his euphoria, the engineer failed to see that she wasn't only healed, but that she had no single wrinkle. Her skin was impeccable and impenetrable. She emitted no aromas because she didn't produce any type of fluid that would detoxify her organism. She had also lost the ability to gesture while she maintained a stoic, almost cryptic expression. She had stopped eating a week ago, had stopped drinking two days ago. She closed her eyes and tried to escape, tried to imagine herself struggling to wake up from a slow nightmare. No, that wasn't possible. But she could look at every milli-inch of her interior. Her interior resembled a city inhabited by small automata. Spherical, cylindrical, polytypical, conical, triangular, and polyhedral. Some were flat, while others were volumetric. A dark universe went from an exuberant indigo to a black that was impossible to distinguish in its beginning and end, moved in ordered yet convulsive ways. She still distinguished some elements other than those small robotic circumstances that hunted white, red, or magenta dots. They gradually filled small green or yellow holes, winning the battle. I was right. We mustn't just rearrange the atoms and put them in their place to eradicate viruses, autoimmune diseases, congenital disorders, or the ravages of old age. We've got to replace old or diseased cells with artificial ones that think like human beings, feel and act in their likeness so that they can convey the original ones that they aren't intruders, but they're equals. Stronger. Better endowed, without blind spots, without failures, so that the original ones will copy them, imitate them. In this way, 
we will no longer have to manufacture them. Individuals themselves will begin to develop them, self-build. After several attempts to inject her dose, he gave up. All the needles broke in half. He looked down at her without seeing her, as if he didn't distinguish between himself and her. He saw only his success, but not his failure. Then something happened that neither of them could have foreseen. She kissed him. The kiss was intense, but lacked a loving touch, only communicative. A need born from an interior that was her and wasn't her at the same time, as it was forced to enter the organism that was only empathic in appearance. And in that disparate exchange, her saliva, thicker and more powerful, invaded him. He fell under the grass, convulsed for a few seconds, until he fell asleep. She went back to the mound to lose herself again in the pale face of the moon, sterile, motionless. Was there any kind of life? She shuddered again. She still had a bit of her left. Fear of extinction was the only thing all species had in common. Maybe that was why she kissed him, so as not to be alone in her new nature. Perhaps that was what she thought. Nearby, yet apart, the engineer lay asleep on the grass, his good intentions intertwined with his ego, which already mourned for humanity, although he didn't yet know it. Cecilia Udave is a Mexican fiction writer, essayist, and scholar based in Guadalajara. She has authored numerous books, most recently the short story collection Microcolapsos, 2017. Her work has been widely anthologized and translated into various languages such as English, Japanese, and Korean. Hey guys! As many of you know, I am a sucker for stories that have anything to do with the advancement of the human race, be it forced evolution, augmentation, or nanobots taking over the body. <laughs> anything like that, I just gobble up. It's one of the passions I have in actual science. And while I don't think we're going to have to worry about nanobots turning us into emotionless machines, I actually do have a little bit of a worry about that when it comes to some other aspects of advancing technologies. For instance, some people argue that that may be the case with Elon Musk's Neuralink. Eventually he wants us to basically have a computer as a extra layer to our brain, and we'll have at our fingertips a supercomputer with all the information of the human knowledge all in one place that we can grab. And while I think that will make everything much faster to figure out, I don't think it's going to fundamentally change the way that we operate on a day-to-day -day basis. We still have the underlying emotional structure of our body. But that's where I have the issue with downloading your brain into a computer. A lot of who we are comes from our emotions, and a lot of our emotions do not come from our brain. They come from all over our body. Different endocrine systems and all sorts of different things go into it, even your heart rate. So. If we can't simulate all of that just by scanning the brain, who are you going to be when you get uploaded? Are you going to be regular emotional, you know, Chris, or are you going to be emotionless, completely logical, and have no real sense of what it is to be human anymore? I love thinking about this stuff because we are in a revolutionary time with science. They're actually saying we're not that far from downloading a human brain. Less than a decade is what some people predict. That's why I love stories like this, because while it seems like science fiction right now, we may look back in 10, 20 years and it's old news. I love that about science. It scares the living hell out of me, but I can't help but love it. If you're listening on YouTube, be sure to let me know what you think about this topic down in the description. Or if you're listening on the podcast, just be sure to subscribe for brand new short stories two to three times a week. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.